No, he's dead. No, he's dead. Are you dead? Yes. Jon Snow died. He is really dead. <laughs> hey, it's Kim McKay. To start off with, I am really happy with this episode. Last episode was absolutely appalling according to Game of Thrones standards. But to be honest, it had to be a good episode. It didn't have any dawn in it. <laughs> Okay, so we start off with Bran having this amazing vision that gives us both Eddard Stark as a young fighter, we have Benjamin Stark, we have Sir Roderick, we have Lyanna Stark, which is, you know, something no one was really expecting. And the one, the only, Hodor. Now with Game of Thrones putting such importance on Hodor's backstory, some of these weird crazy theories we thought were just joke ones because it's about Hodor can seriously start to take weight. Hodor's the great other. <clears throat> we move on from Hodor awesomeness to some mirror being mopey and moody like a teenager stuck in a weird tree place with some crazy ass creepy looking harpy people who are apparently supposed to be the children of the forest. If I was having a nice good dream and I wake up to that thing looming over me, I'm about to fight a bitch. Now when it comes to Davos and Thorn in this conflict, I'm kind of conflicted because on one hand I feel like it's unjustified for them to have this conflict, especially for Davos's end. Maybe with Ed and some of the other Nightwatch people, which I hope would be a bit more than that, but we could we could deal with it just that. But between him and Davos, I'm not I'm not entirely sure. But I also think that Davos is an amazing character with some awesome dialogue, who's got a really important part to play in bringing back my favorite character. <clears throat> But the Night's Watch try to break down the door and conveniently, one one busts in with this awesome ass Rawr. Okay, I, I have some work on my giant impressions, but not the point. Then the wildlings sweep in and take over Castle Black with like two deaths at max. One of them was like a very slow motion, really stupid, like let's just ping him in the shoulder with his tiniest bolt. And then he gets like whipped out. Awesome scene. I really want to see some behind the scenes of how they made it happen because that'd be pretty awesome. I also did like the stubborn, almost not giving up Thorn. For a second there, we all thought he was going to charge them and die, but he held back in the very end, which is kind of disappointing. I'd love to see uh, them get the uh, face split open. Also, very disappointed Ollie didn't die. He ran into them all crazy trying to kill them. One of the other Night's Watch people, just just, just just following orders, wasn't even one of the bad ones. Okay, he runs forward, tries to slice them. Nah, he just gets killed. As soon as Ollie tries to do it, nah, nah, let's just capture him. Just, let's bear hug him and then put him in the cell because Ollie is the main character. It doesn't matter. Now, I must say, this wasn't my favorite scene in this episode by far. I feel like really did just make this kind of gap that didn't really need to be there. We all know that Robert Strong is this powerful, muscly guy who's just deadly force, not talking, you know, conflicts the will of Cersei. The whole purpose of this entire setup and scene was to display that the people still remember Cersei Schwalker Shane and that Robert Strong is powerful and badass, but we, we can establish both those things from last season anyway, we didn't need this. Also we had that conflict between Cersei and the Lannister soldiers who were ordered by Tommen, and that could have displayed him as a powerful person anyway, so we didn't need that other scene. Doesn't matter. Okay, we're going to move on to this scene with Jamie and Tommen. This scene had some very similar vibes than from the scene we got with Jamie and Marcella in the boat. It felt so much like Jamie acting like a father figure, talking about Cersei like, oh, go talk to your mother and stuff like that, sounding very much like he was the father in that relationship. And then we could also see that very obvious switch over from his personality and the way he presents himself and his relationship to Tommen when the High Sparrow walks in. I gotta say, I really like this dialogue in the trailer. I also really like it here. It's amazing, it brings out both the guys' characters, and that's exactly how I would think they would bounce off each other. You know, also, Jamie was bluffing because he is terrible with his left hand, which is also something really awesome when you rewatch it again with that in mind. It's like, oh wow, <laughs> he's just bullshitting right here. This is so season one, Jamie. And then finally, we get this Tommen and Cersei scene where, oh my god, Cersei is going crazy, I swear. We There's no way to read into their mind, though. She's like a blank slate, so dead there. I have no idea if she wants to support him. Maybe he's going to try to be vengeful. Maybe he's going to try to kill Tommen. There's just no way to read into that craziness. You know there's so much psychological shit happening in there, but you just can't find out. Okay, so no Danny or Dora this episode, but we got some really awesome marine shit. 
Straight off the back, we have that quick, awesome vibe with Tyrion. He makes a eunuch joke, which also applies to Grey Worm, so he gets a bit offended, and that's great. And then we have Tyrion showing off his knowledge and his counseling skills, being all swagger-like, which is really awesome. I hope we get a lot more of that that season. Then we have the epic scene with him in the dragon pit. It's just so tense the entire time. We have this whole huge bonding relationship, trying to undo the chains, shit like that. The, we get the, the dragon recognizing that he's the friend, which he predicted beforehand from reading his books and stuff. It's so good. I can already tell the comment section is going to be full with Tyrion the Targaryen all over the place. Now I've looked into that theory and I understand a lot of the shit they're talking about with the evidence and stuff like that. So it literally could happen. I am I'm. I think that they have enough there that if they did it, it wouldn't be, you know, you know, butchering the book series or butchering his storyline. But I still believe he's a Lannister because the Tywin relationship with him is just too good to just not really be biological and blood. You are not my son. I am your son. I have always been your son. I love how as soon as he got off the chains and the dragons sit around, he's like, Bitch, I'm out of here. Okay, they're progressing on Arya's storyline really nicely. She's getting some more beatings in the middle of the street when no one gives a fuck about it. And then Jacken shows up and tests her three times, which, you know... All tests must come in three. Even though Arya is consistently saying that she's nobody, she's moving on with her training stuff, I still believe that her Stark, her inner self, will stay with her and she will rebel against them, run away, fight them, whatever on on, and move on with the storyline back in Westeros or with Nymeria. Okay, so these scenes are always amazing. I love Roos's and Ramsay's relationship, but now it's over, so no more good scenes like that, I guess. Also, the way that the mace just trembles and the like just sheer craziness and brutality that exudes itself from Ramsay and his actions is just, just it's great. Oh then and then Ramsay acts up a bit. We we all know Ramsay. He's he's a, he's a good kid at heart. He's just sometimes a bit over the top. You know, don't worry, don't worry. I'll 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 make sure he learns his lesson. Now we all can tell that Brian clearly said a man instead of the hound, which was HBO simply doing that for the lols. The relationship that the Hound had with Sansa and then Arya is this unique, awesome bond that um, Stargirl seemed to have with the Hound. Even though he seems like a dangerous and dark man to most people, those two know him in his inner ways and trust him a bit because they have helped them out both throughout this time. And so I think they're reserving the reaction of Sansa to him again later on when we see him as a grave digger or in the clean game ball. Okay, so book readers have been waiting for this scene for a very long time. In the books, he dies very mysteriously. He just kind of falls off the bridge, clearly apparently blown off by winds and stuff, but it's heavily implied that it's Euron, and we kind of have to figure that out. There's a little bit of mystery that it could be a faceless man, but we mostly believe that it's Euron. And I think the show simply made it very much more clear because they didn't have enough time to be able to deal with this sneaky, awesome writing skills with the Greyjoys because we didn't put them in last season. Also, the chances that someone would pick up his body and it would be in the right enough condition to be able to identify him after that fall through a giant, you know, gushing storm with lots of rain and stuff is pretty unlikely. It may have possibly washed up ashore at some point and they could get the body later on, but like right when the next day, or what we assume is the next day, when the funeral's happening and shit like that, I didn't think they would. Now the way that they present the King's Moot in this is a little bit off. I believe they really should have followed the books a bit longer with this. They have, they're going to introduce Euron. They probably won't introduce Victorian, but they will introduce Euron. They could have just waited a bit to introduce the idea of a King's Moot so it would fit well with the Euron. Okay, so this scene was complete torture for every single person who watched it. It was the most drawn out, slowed down, changing of shots from this character's reaction to this character's reaction, really slow, cleaning up the body. Oh, come on, Game of Thrones, show us somebody he's alive! And then after this extremely long, almost deafening silence, where like, you had to turn up the television to be able to hear shit that's going on, just, just like the bare wiping of the like towel over his blood and shit, and then, oh, <gasps> John's back, baby. Make sure to subscribe to the channel for awesome reviews and shit like that that's coming up. I've also got some other awesome plans, you know, cool videos between episodes and shit, so we're looking forward for that. Also, make sure that you really like my stuff because, you know, that really helps a lot because I'm a YouTuber and that's what YouTubers ask for at the end of the videos. Okay, see you guys next time.